she told that to me in the fourth grade. Never, ever forget it. All right, there we go. I'm on. Okay, <clears throat> two mistakes already, but I think we're going to be okay. So here's the thing. He, he created this, this contrast between God and suffering, and he wants to make it seem like it is impossible for God to exist and allow suffering. Have you ever felt like that, though? I mean, ask yourself that question. When you suffer, when you experience pain, when we look at things like war, the Holocaust, when there's a woman who desperately wants a child and she has miscarriage after miscarriage, there are a lot of, of things that we, we suffer from in this life. We lose people that we love, relationships end, death happens. Last week, I, I ended the sermon with a story about a man named Nabil Qureshi, who was a uh, Christian apologist. He converted from in Islam to Christianity. He had a baby girl named Aya, and she was a little over a year and a half old. And last year, he discovered that he had stomach cancer. And here's a man who is a Christian who follows after God, and yet he dies within a year. He, he passed away just a few weeks ago. I mean, he was a Christian. How could God let somebody like that suffer? How could God let the most horrendous things that we could ever imagine happen? And I don't know about you, but I have really felt the pull of suffering, not only in my own life, but in the life that is around me. And it does bring about this question, does God really exist? And if God really does exist, is he the God that we read about in the Bible? Is he the God of love and the God of righteousness? Is he the God of truth? Or is he like what a lot of, of early uh, church fathers believed, that he was this God up there that didn't really care about us? Or maybe there were two types of gods, a good God and an evil God, and they were in competition with one another. You see, the reality is, is that we can be ignorant of what it means for God to be a loving God or, or what it means for God to be an all-powerful God. And here's the logical fallacy in the argument that was stated to you this morning. It is not logically possible for God to create a world in which he forces everyone to freely choose the right thing. Let me state that again. It is not logically possible for God to create a world in which he forces everyone to freely choose to do the right thing. You see, we all have free will because God loves us. God isn't going to force us to choose him or force us to choose the right thing. And so at the cost of giving us free will, at the cost of having a relationship of choice, God has to permit and allow suffering. And so it is a logical fallacy to assume that because God is all-powerful, he can create and actualize any type of world that he wants. You see, God, of course, wants us all to choose to do the right thing, but more importantly, it is loving and it is good for us to have that choice. That's the first misunderstanding. The second misunderstanding is understanding the nature of God's love. As I alluded to you previously, it isn't very loving to force someone into a relationship with you. I mean, think about that, right? Husbands, wives, can you imagine being forced to marry the person uh, some type of arranged marriage where you have no say in the matter? Can you imagine being forced, right, to parent a certain child? And some of you are thinking, amen, I do not want to parent that child, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and some of you kids are thinking, man, I'm really glad that those people are not my parents. I would not want them as my parents. I mean, relationships are better because we get to choose them. C.S. Lewis wrote a book about the problem of pain, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, but C.S. Lewis actually wrote a journal about grief observed, and C.S. Lewis had lost somebody that he grew to dearly love. C.S. Lewis was an atheist for uh, the beginning part of his life, and he came to believe in Christianity because of logic and reason and evidence. And C.S. Lewis became a giant in the Christian faith. He wrote this really cool series called The Chronicles of Narnia, in case you haven't heard of the man. And they made some movies within the last couple years. Well, C.S. Lewis uh, remained single also for the majority part of his life. And later on, uh, he was a college professor. He was an avid writer. Uh, his stepson, he actually did eventually have a stepson, said the man read a book and he never forgot what he read. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's, that's just operating on a different level. Sometimes I, I'll listen to a sermon, and I couldn't tell you what was preached on 15 minutes after I leave. Have you ever been there? I think we've all been there. But the man read a book, and he never forgot what he read. Well, C.S. Lewis met a woman named Joy, 
And Joy actually grew up in the United States. And she had a marriage, and they had two sons, and that marriage ended in divorce. I believe the man was unfaithful, um, but I'll have to go back and and research why they actually had a divorce. Well, Joy ends up bringing her her two sons over to the UK because C.S. Lewis actually grew up uh, in England. And so she began exchanging letters with C.S. Lewis, and they actually had a friendship. They had no intentions of having any type of romantic relationship whatsoever. They were just two intellects debating over ideas. And so as they grew, grew to know each other, now we have Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and text messages. They actually, you know, wrote letters back then. Once they actually grew to love each other, they decided that they wanted to get married. Well, there was a problem. She ended up, got diagnosed with cancer. And so there she lay in the hospital, and they got married in the hospital, and she survived for a a few years later. And I actually have a picture of C.S. Lewis and Joy in their their life that they got to share with each other. So their their relationship started very young, and she ended up dying. And C.S. Lewis, an intellectual elitist, one of the most brilliant men ever to have lived and, and, and been a Christian, he wrote in his journal about the experience that he had through her death. And he said something like this, her absence is like the sky spread over everything. Just a a, a deep hurt, a deep pain of losing someone that he cared for deeply. He went on to write this in his journal, which was published into a book that you can buy today. He says, there is a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says, or perhaps hard to want to take it in. And if you've ever lost somebody that you love, you you know exactly what he's talking about. He said, it's so uninteresting, yet I want the others to be about me. He said, I dread the moments when the house is empty. If only they would talk to one another and not me. When my father passed away at the age of 14, I can totally understand what he's talking about. You want to be alone, but you want to be around other people. You you feel like the world just doesn't understand what you're going through. You have so much sadness and so much anxiety and so much hurt. You have dreams of seeing them alive again. You wake up in the morning. I I would wake up in the morning and, and go to call my dad, and I would forget that he had passed away. It was just such an incredible amount of hurt and sorrow that really no religion, no fellowship, there, there's really nothing that can quite answer the void that it, that it feels like to lose somebody that you love. Suffering really hurts. And so I would ask God questions like this, just like C.S. Lewis. Why would God let this happen? Why would God let me feel this pain? Why didn't God save my father? Why did God let everyone else enjoy their life and have the childhood that I always dreamed about, but for me, I was chosen to suffer? God, if you really do exist, the big question is why? And what possible reason could God have to justify my pain or your pain or the pain that we see in the world? You see, at times our suffering seems to be so utterly pointless that it drives us into doubt, that eventually drives us into disobedience, that eventually drives us into rejecting God. And that is the problem of pain. And that's why Christian theologians and authors like C.S. Lewis have written extensively on this issue. And so if you will, this morning, go through with me some reasons why God might allow our pain and get a Christian perspective on our pain and our suffering And so that maybe if you are going through pain, or pain is just around the corner, you'll be able to deal with it through the attitude and through the way that God would have you deal with it. The first thing that I would like to bring to your attention this morning is this, is that we are limited in our knowledge and our perspective. We are limited. We do not have the big picture. We certainly are not in a position to say, God probably lacks good reasons to allow this suffering, or to allow this pain in this world. You see, we are not the Lord's counselor. God sees the picture of the world. He sees the beginning and the end. He sees the impact of every free will decision that would ever be made from the beginning of time. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. And we have a very limited scope and a very limited perspective. When I look back, for instance, at my father's death, and that was almost 15 years ago, I can see how God would allow that type of suffering in my life to bring me to the point of where I am today. The Bible says in Romans chapter 11, verse 34, For who has known the mind of the Lord, 
who, who has become his counselor. We are not only limited in knowledge, but we're limited in time. We're limited in space. We're limited in intelligence and insight and wisdom. But God sees every detail of history. You see, if I could look back in time and I could see the ramifications of God allowing my father to pass away, I would have been able to more adequately deal with my suffering and my pain at that time. And if only we could have God's perspective, we probably would look at the majority of the suffering and the evil in this world and we can say, ah, God, I see what you're talking about. I understand. I get it. It was worth it. And so here I am, 15 years later, looking back into time, and I see that God allowing my father to pass away is what drove me to the Lord. I began seeking and researching and praying and studying. And then a few years later, I decided I wanted to go into the ministry, which eventually brought me to Winchester, Virginia, to pursue my bachelor's degree in biblical studies. And that's where I met my wife. And that's where we became married, and we've been married for almost nine years. And that led me to here. If I wouldn't have been in Winchester, Virginia, I would have never accepted a ministry here with my wife, Angel. I wouldn't have had Piper. And so I can honestly, and this is for me now, this isn't for you, I can honestly look back at that incredible amount of pain and suffering, and I can say, it is well with my soul. I get it. I understand God, you don't want death and disease to happen. That wasn't your original plan, but you let it take place because of a great good that would come about it. And there have been countless people that I've been able to share my comfort with and the gospel with, and I have baptized into Christ, all because God allowed that type of pain and suffering. And that is my limited scope of being able to briefly look back to a time in history when I was in pain. And I want to think about your pain. I want you to think about the most terrible moments that you have ever experienced. Are you able to look back in time and glean from those and maybe find little nuggets of truth of saying, ah, God, I get it, I understand. You see, I can sympathize now with those who feel pain. I understand what C.S. Lewis is going through, although it was in a different capacity. But there was something else that I lacked. Not only perspective, but I lacked information. And we do too. We lack information about our suffering. Let me show you a picture here, right? All of us would look at this man who weighs 360 pounds. How many of you would be willing to say that is a world-class athlete, right? I mean, a lot of you look at me and you're like, Rick looks pretty athletic. That guy definitely does not, okay, right? No, I, I would get destroyed no matter where I went. But if we had a little bit more information, right, about this guy, we probably could bring some perspective. He actually is a world-class athlete. He is a professional sumo wrestler who won two world champions. So do you see how our perspective on this situation changes once we get a little bit more information? And that's the same way it is with our suffering. You see, when we consider the arguments for the existence of God, when we consider the arguments for the truthfulness of Christianity, it provides perspective to our pain. And there are a lot of arguments. I've just listed a a few of them up on the screen for you that you could actually go check out. And if you have never even heard of one of these arguments, you have done yourself a disservice. There are Christian scientists, theologians, philosophers, people who are actually smart, unlike me, people who operate at the academic level, who defend Christianity relentlessly, intellectually, efficiently. And they debate some of the most profound, recognized atheists in the world, and they come out with their heads held high and on high ground, and the atheist position lacking. And so you consider things like the cosmological argument, or the teleological argument, the moral argument, the ontological argument, the contingency argument, when you look at the applicability of mathematics to our world, when you look at the argument from intentionality, when you consider the historical argument for the resurrection of Jesus or the personal experience argument, you walk away saying God exists and Christianity is true. And these are unavoidable facts. These are things that you cannot get away from. And so if God does exist, and he does, and if Christianity is true, and it is, we have to have a better explanation for our pain and our suffering other than God does not exist. That is the background information that we need to look at our pain and our suffering through. 
And so when we discover these truths, we, were, we are able to provide perspective to our pain. And so I asked you the question this morning, are there any good reasons for why God would let you and I suffer? Even in some of the worst ways that we see. I'd like to read to you a scripture out of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 through 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so before God created the world, even though time wasn't existing yet, God saw the beginning and the end, and he decided to go through with the world because it would be worth it. The suffering and the pain that we experience was worth it to God. Number one, I think one of the greatest things uh, for our suffering is free will. The ability to choose. Everyone's going to walk out of here and make a choice. You all chose to be here this morning. You can choose to accept God or to reject God. It is better to have free will than to be robots on a string and not have free will. Would you agree with that? That is a reason why God permitted suffering, is because free will is better. And so if God were to create a world in which there was no free will, and we were all robots, and we were all forced to make our decision, that is not the best possible world. God cares deeply for us. He does not want to force us into a relationship with him. And so if we come to God freely, if we choose to love God, that comes at a cost, suffering. Number two, uh, let me read to you this scripture before we move on. It's in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Joshua is talking to the nation of Israel. And he says, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. And look what he says at the end. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so we all have a choice that we can make. Number two, why would God allow suffering? Well, here's a reason. Seeking fellowship with God through suffering. I can honestly say that I probably would not have been in the ministry if God would not have allowed my suffering as a 14-year-old boy. I can almost say that I may not have been a Christian at this point in my life. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I definitely know that God allowed the suffering in my life to bring me into a closer relationship with him. And so if you see, with less suffering, fewer people would seek after God. Psalms 119.71 says this, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statues. He's talking to God. God, thank you for my suffering. Thank you for my pain. If you actually research this, you will come to know that this is absolutely true. When great suffering happens in the world, people will turn back to God. And I do have a graphic that I will share with you later on. Number three, why would God allow suffering? Well, how about character formation? And these are just a few examples. Some of our most important character forming events have happened through suffering. And how many of you can honestly say it was because you made a stupid decision, right? I mean, sometimes we suffer because we are dumb. <laughs> That's just the truth of the matter. Sometimes we suffer because bad things happen. The majority of times we suffer because we make stupid decisions. But it shapes and it forms our character. And this is what the Bible teaches. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 says this. Consider it joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let the endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God wants to shape your character. One of the ways he does that is through suffering and through pain and through trial. Why would God let us suffer? Well, number four, we will have an eternal appreciation of heaven. How can we fully appreciate health without sickness? How can we fully appreciate wealth without poverty? How can we fully appreciate love without hate? And so Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And so these are some possible reasons why God would choose a world in which suffering happened, over a world in which there was no suffering. But more importantly, if God exists and Christianity is true and God has good reasons 
to allow us to suffer, we should expect there to be Christian doctrines that provide an even deeper level of understanding about the problem of pain. And that's exactly what we find. And I want to share four of those with you this morning. Number one, the chief purpose in this life is not happiness. And that may come as a shock to you. The chief purpose in this life is not your happiness, according to the Bible. It is not uh, your personal happiness. The chief purpose in this life is knowledge and relationship with God. That's God's ultimate purpose for you. We find things like Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. He disciplines us for his good, so that what? Because he hates us? Because he loves to just zap at us and see us suffer? No, so that we may share in his holiness. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 put it like this. He had researched everything. This is Solomon. He, he had the most money. He had the most relationships. He had the best house. He had everything. He was literally the wealthiest man in the world. And he said the conclusion when all is heard is this. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Because this applies to every person. The Bible is very clear. Your happiness is secondary to your holiness and your relationship with God. And so God allows us to experience suffering because ultimately it is about our relationship with him. If you were to ask the Apostle Paul, Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, why would God let you suffer? And that's the question that we're asking this morning. Why would God let us suffer? And here's what Paul writes. He says, I suffer that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I suffer, Paul says, because it's about being intimately knowledgeable of Jesus Christ. It's about knowing not just intellectually the power of his resurrection, but experiencing the power of his resurrection, and that is a relationship with God. You see, suffering can definitely bring a deeper relationship more intimate knowledge of God, and we must suffer in order to achieve that. You see, the whole point of human history is that God has given us free will as he draws his creatures into a relationship with himself to experience an unending kingdom of eternal life. And we know that this is true, that suffering actually drives people back to God. I've got a picture for you up in the world. This was the Center for Research um, of natural disasters between 1996 and 2005. And they showed that the, suffer, the, the, the countries that endured the most hardship often showed the highest growth rates in Christianity. And here are just some examples for you uh, in the, in the, on the screen. China, under communism with Mao, Mao Tsung, who's the worst human leader, killed the most people that we have knowledge of, that we have record of. He was a horrible person put people through terrible things, his own countrymen, and yet Christianity exploded. You see what's crazy? Is that you have an atheist philosopher who teaches at a credited university will look at something like the floods in Indonesia and say, see, God doesn't exist. And then you've got someone in an Asian country who has lost everything, who feels the suffering, who's being looked at by the atheist, and he is saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. It draws him into a relationship with God. Think about how paradoxical that is and how uh, just irregular that seems to be to us. How could an atheist who feels no pain be driven further away from God, but yet someone who loses everything searches and seeks and finds the Lord and has a relationship with him? It shows us that something is severely lacking in the perspective of our pain at our universities. C.S. Lewis, he wrote this. We could ignore pleasure, but pain insists upon being paid attention to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciences, but shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to arouse a deaf world. But that's the problem. His Christianity teaches that we do have a deaf world. The world is in utter rebellion against a holy and just and loving and righteous God. Humans are invoking evil upon themselves by making the free will choice, the free will decision to reject God. And this is what we find all throughout scripture. 
Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and what? Death through sin. So death spread to all men because all men have sinned. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is what? Death. Sin invokes death upon us, disease and suffering. And we become so irrational that we think, if I just reject God, I'll even be more happy. If I choose sin, it brings life instead of death, and the opposite is true. That is why sin is so deceitful. We make the free will decision to invoke sin and death upon ourselves. And finally, James summarizes it like this. But each one, when is tempted, he is carried away, and he is enticed in his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Our choice to sin and reject God, which is our free will decision, comes out of consequence. You see, God loves us enough to give us the power to choose, and that's what Christianity teaches. And so although God foreknew our death and our disease and our suffering that would happen from Adam until now until the end of the world, he already made the decision to enter it. He made a decision to enter this world, to not only redeem this world from pain and suffering, but also to walk through your pain and your suffering with you. And the Bible teaches this. So the third doctrine is this. We are not alone in our suffering, and God loves us through our suffering. You see, Christ suffered in this life, not just for us, but now he suffers with us, and we suffer with him. He offers us hope. And in time, he will make all things new. The book of Isaiah actually looks forward to this time when the Messiah would come. And it describes this upcoming suffering servant. And look at at the descriptions of this. It's in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 5, and it says this. It's speaking about Jesus. He was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with what? Grief. Is grief a sin? Is feeling sorrow a sin? If it's so, Jesus wasn't sinless. These are emotions that we feel. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He experienced the depths of our suffering, of our hurts, of our pain, of our loss. And it says, and like one of them who men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And then look, surely our griefs Our griefs, not just our sin, he himself bore. And our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. In other words, people looked at Jesus and said, man, he must have really messed up in order to be punished like that. Have you ever felt that way? God, why are you punishing me? What wrong did I commit that I would experience this type of suffering? Verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment of our well-being fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. See, the cross is the answer. Jesus not only became the punishment for our sins, but he experienced the consequences of our sins. He experienced our sorrow. He experienced our grief. He approached the cross with arms held wide open, embracing the pain, refusing to numb it with alcohol. Jesus experiences our pain. He touches our pain. And he understands when you are alone at night in your house and you are suffering, he is there. He is not some distant God up sitting on a throne in heaven, totally tapped out to what you experience. He experienced it at all. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 says, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so we know this famous verse in John three sixteen: for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. You see, it was God's love that gave him up to our pain. It was God's love 
that gave him up to the cross. It was God's love that allowed Jesus to come down and supernaturally experience our sufferings, our griefs, our disappointments, our shame, our guilt, that he might identify with us. And so we really do have a God that says, I know what you go through. I've experienced your pain. I'm walking through you with it. I am here. The fourth doctrine is this, and it is the best one, is that God's purpose is not restricted to this life, but spills over beyond the grave into eternal life. And so those who suffer and choose Christ will be overwhelmed by an ocean of joy for all of eternity, and we desperately cling on to that sacred truth. This life is not the end. Our suffering and our pain is not pointless. There is more to be enjoyed. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary and light affliction is producing in us an eternal weight of glory that will be far beyond all comparison. You see, God has a new life, a new heavens, and a new earth that we can freely choose today that is beyond comparison to what we experience in this life. And so Paul says in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen only last a while, they're temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so as we wait for eternity, we should tactfully prepare ourselves for the glory to be revealed and expected. That's why we're in this life. That's why God lets us suffer. That's why God lets us choose. This is our preparation for the real enjoyment, for the real life, for the hope that is to be enjoyed. God exists. Christianity is true. We have a limited perspective and a limited knowledge on our pain. And if we could just step back and trust that God knows what he's doing, God experienced the pain himself, this life is not the end. We have hope, we have purpose, and we have life. And so what shall we do? Okay, Rick, I get it. But I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I get it that God exists. I get it that Christianity is true. I get it that I'm irrational for saying that just because evil exists, that means God does not exist. I know this to be true. What am I supposed to do? Well, the Bible simply says this in 1 Peter 4, verse 13. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ... Keep on rejoicing. Don't give up. So that you, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Don't give up. Keep on rejoicing. Thank God for the good. Look at the background information, the truthfulness of God. Christianity is true. Jesus really did suffer and arise from the dead. Keep on rejoicing until Jesus comes again. And so I'd like to end with you how I began about a story of C.S. Lewis. As I said, he wrote the story, A Grief Observed. It was his journal that was turned into a book. And if you read the introduction, it does talk about the perspective that people had on C.S. Lewis and how the pain that he experienced really did impact them. And C.S. Lewis in his journal wrote this. He says, when you are happy, so happy... You have no sense of needing him, speaking of God. So happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption. If you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. And we can all understand that, right? I mean, you go to God when things are good and you feel great, you feel appreciated, you feel the blessing of God, you feel close to him, you feel connected, everything is going really well. And you feel like God is standing there with open arms saying, yes, I am blessing you and your life is going well. But then he writes this, but go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain. And what do you find? This is C.S. Lewis. A door slammed in your face, and a sound of a bolting, and a double bolting on the inside, and after that, silence. You ever felt like that before? I sure have. But then he 
understands and reflects this. C.S. Lewis wrote, I know now, Lord, that you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face questions die away, what other answer would suffice? Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, when Jesus is hanging on the cross with his arms wide open, he shouted out to God, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus asked the question on the cross, where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? And he sees a door slammed in his face in silence from heaven. Jesus gets it. He understands. He has the same feelings that we have. And in his humanity, he became the penalty for our sins. And he experienced our griefs and our sorrows. Jesus is the answer. And so I don't know what you've come to church with this morning. I don't know what pain you felt in your past. I don't know what horrors you have seen or experienced. Don't let your suffering override what you know to be true. God exists. Christianity is true. Jesus suffered for you, and Jesus suffers with you, and he is the answer. And so if you are not in a relationship with Christ this morning, we're going to invite you to do that. And so if you'll stand, and we're going to pray, if you know you need to be in a relationship with God, we're going to invite you to obey the gospel. Place your faith in Jesus Christ and being baptized for the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you for your mercy and your hope. And God, I pray that we would be willing to open up our minds and open up our hearts to the truthfulness that you have laid out before us. God, we know that you are there. We know that it's a lie to believe that you are not present with us in our suffering. We know that Jesus went through that so that you would never leave us, you would never forsake us. So God, thank you for speaking truth into our hearts and into our life. God, as hard as it is to pray, we thank you for our tribulation, our trials, and our suffering, and we give you the glory. God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who knows they need to accept your grace and your love, who, who know that they need to embrace your forgiveness, God, I pray that they would have the courage to do that. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.